Welcome to the second day of the conference. Uh, we have our keynote speech now, and it's uh, Steve Tanimoto from the University of Washington uh, Computer Science and Engineering Department who is uh, giving the keynote. And um, Steve is coming from the perspective of computer science, but he's written work, very important work on uh, liveness in um, the design of computer languages. And uh, Steve is also a musician, plays the piano and uh, jazz music, so he should know a thing or two about improvisation and liveness. So I look forward to hearing your talk, Steve. Thank you, Thor. So I thought I would uh, take advantage of this setting. And uh, so uh, thank you for your indulgence. I want to show you what kind of motivates me for liveness by starting off with uh, Bill Evans' uh, piece. Uh, this is uh, Turn Out the Stars, and I'll just play for about three minutes, and then I'll give you a normal talk. <coughs> great to be here at this live coding meeting where computing and music come together. <laughs> but um, for me, uh, I've always wondered why, why computing couldn't be more like music and, uh, and why the experience of programming couldn't be a little bit more like playing an instrument where you really get immediate feedback uh, from the instrument so you sort of know if you're on the right track. And uh, so uh, with that, let me try to give you a perspective on live programming, uh, and I, I guess I realized I'm probably the oldest person in the room here. Um, so I'll try to uh, take advantage of that and give you a sort of a historical perspective here. <laughs> uh, okay. So I was asked to talk about the computing as opposed to the philosophical aspects of uh, live coding, and so I'll try to do that. And uh, this will kind of involve uh, going pretty far back into uh, the history of computing. Uh, but let me start just by making an analogy that I think explains one notion of liveness that uh, uh, is one of many. So I won't claim that it is the definitive notion of liveness, but uh, it's a metaphor uh, with electrical circuits. So suppose that we're trying to upgrade the circuitry in our house and uh, we want to replace a old-fashioned light switch with something more modern, maybe a dimmer or a controller for uh, LED lighting. And we sort of have two, two choices for this do-it-yourself exercise. One is to go down into the, the cellar and to try to find the panel, turn off the breaker, 
and uh, make sure it's the right breaker, <laughs> and then go back upstairs and uh, change the switch and uh, hope for the best. But there's another way of doing it, which is to not turn off the breaker, perhaps put gloves on or just be really careful about what you're doing at the, at the junction box and wire it hot and hope that you uh, uh, don't die in the process. So I don't recommend that you do this at home. But uh, there are certain advantages to doing that. It's very easy to tell uh, if you have the right circuit, for example, and uh, you don't have to worry about choosing the right breaker and all that kind of thing. In computing, we can do the same thing, except we, not, we don't necessarily have that, uh, that danger of electrocuting ourselves in the process. And so uh, live programming, the idea of changing the program without stopping it and turning it off, is, uh, is a compelling idea. So uh, here's my definition. Live programming is a process of modifying a running program without stopping the execution. Um, so clearly there are many other notions of liveness, and I'll hint at some of them later. But uh, this is a place to start. And from the point of view of computing, it's a fairly straightforward uh, definition. So let me uh, say why programming needs liveness. You probably all know this, but here's, here's an attempt to justify liveness in programming by going way back to the old days of Fortran. You know, uh, Fortran was invented in response to this uh, uh, desire to escape from, I think, from uh, assembly language programming and, and machine language programming. So John Backus proposed Fortran back in 1953. The first compiler was running in 1957, and uh, a Fortran program looked something like this. Uh, it's not necessarily that different from modern programming languages, but uh, it had lots of limitations. And the, but the real problem was not so much the language itself as the process one had to go through in order to debug a program, to write a program and debug it. So here was a typical cycle for a programmer. Have an idea express it diagrammatically in a flowchart, then convert that to code by uh, perhaps writing the code on a piece of paper and then transferring it to one of these, one of these uh, Fortran coding forms that has a, a square for, <laughs> uh, for each possible character uh, in the program. And then those had to be transferred to uh, Hollerith punched cards. Uh, typically with a special device that would uh, punch out these keys, make a lot of noise, and of course if you actually punched something, you, the only way to, uh, to fix that error would be to start a, an entirely new card. Then typically these cards were read by a card reader that would transfer the information to magnetic tapes, and these magnetic, magnetic tapes uh, would then be carried to the mainframe mounted on, on the tape drives of the mainframe, the mainframe would read them, execute, uh, compile, link, and execute the program. If it were executable, it might not have been executable because there might have been a, a syntax error. Uh, the results would go back onto MagTape. They'd be carried back to the satellite computer, like an IBM 1401, and then uh, and then the the uh, results would be printed out in a line printer and delivered to the programmer, perhaps the next day. Uh, <laughs> So you wait for a whole day, and the news is you have a syntax error, and you have to start the whole cycle again. In 1963, uh, Ivan Sutherland demonstrated a different style of computing where uh, the, the human who is creating something, now instead of going through that nasty process of uh, creating and debugging a Fortran program, is interacting through a graphical display. Uh, and uh, back in uh, 2003, at the 40th anniversary of this, Alan Blackwell and uh, Kerry Rodden created a, a new release of Sutherland's thesis uh, in machine-readable form. And uh, today, uh, uh, the influence of that work I is still with us. So that gave rise to notions of computing with graphics through interactive graphics and even programming through interactive graphics. A whole movement of visual languages uh, developed 
And uh, a lot of the liveness experiments came out of, of that development. So the idea is to try to address the challenges of programming, uh, taking advantage of the visual immediacy of graphics, uh, as well as other aspects. Um, so uh, the promise of visual languages was, was that they could make the programming process more intuitive through graphical representations, um, program logic could be clearer, and uh, semantics of certain operations might be clearer with various icons and so forth. So you get over some of the problems of text. In fact, there are some diehard people who insist on programming languages with no text, although uh, that certainly has its limitations. There's also the notion that uh, a programming environment based on graphics be, could be discoverable. By interacting with things, you can learn how to program and don't need as much instruction. Um, and then uh, a common theme uh, uh, espoused by people like Alan Kay with Smalltalk and so forth is that these interactive graphical systems support uh, creativity, creative expression in a way that uh, traditional programming environments uh, weren't actually designed to do. Um, so in general, th the uh, graphical approach uh, has sought a closer connection between the human programmer and the perceptible structure of the program, the semantics of the program, and some people call this closing the semantic gap. And uh, two ways to achieve this are to uh, increase the visibility of information in a computing environment. I call that transparency, making things visible that are normally invisible so that we can understand what's going on. And the other is to reduce temporal latency, to boost liveness, to make, uh, to make the computer react uh, as quickly as possible after the programmer, the user, uh, performs some action. So these two, these two aspects, increasing visibility and reducing latency, are two keys to uh, helping people better program computers. Here's a timeline uh, in which I'm trying to give some sort of perspective on these developments. And uh, I've put a few landmark systems on here. There are many, many other systems. And uh, I apologize to anyone who is closely <laughs> uh, associated with any of those for not uh, putting them here. But I just wanted to mention a few of these. And to say that this, this history sort of can be broken out into various eras, uh, the first being where uh, graphical representations were used in computing primarily as documentation. They're not executable. So that's the first, the, the blue era there that uh, goes back to the 60s or even 50s. And, uh, and it doesn't end, but, uh, but the next era begins somewhere around the uh, mid to late 70s with systems like uh, David Canfield Smith's Pygmalion, uh, which is a graphical computing environment where uh, the graphical representation itself, after it's drawn, can be executed. And then there's another era that begins um, in the mid to late 80s where the diagrams were not only executable, but they were responsive so that if you uh, performed an edit on one of these diagrams, the semantics would be instantly reflected somehow, either in a running program or uh, uh, by the program suddenly starting and then, uh, and then continuing to run. So um, I'll, I'll uh, give you a screenshot shortly of Chipwits, which was, uh, even though it's sort of a, a children's game, uh, robot programming environment, it demonstrated uh, executable diagrams in a very palpable way. Um, and some other systems, the uh, alternate reality kit, uh, Conman, and, uh, and then I'll show you in a little bit more detail a system that uh, I put together, I call the Data Factory, and, uh, and then we'll move on. So let me tell you about this liveness hierarchy that I described in a paper back in 1990. Uh, when I was uh, introducing a visual language for image processing called Viva, I identified these four levels that um, a number of folks said they found this hierarchy to be useful. But the, the first level is the basic flowchart that's not executable, so it's, it's only live in the, in the most trivial sense. It's, uh, it's a representation of information, uh, not for the computer, but for humans. Maybe that's not so, so bad. Maybe that's, <laughs> that's fine. 
Um, so that I call the informative or level one uh, Leibniz uh, uh, type. And the, the next level uh, means that the, the representation that you have, whether it's a flow chart or anything else, is executable. So it's, in, it's significant in the machine. It can be interpreted, uh, compiled, or, or whatnot. Um, at the third level, um, the system not only is uh, informative and significant, or the representation is informative and significant, but uh, any edit that you do will trigger some sort of update to the computation, typically by, by uh, running it. And then at level four, we have a continuous running process that's being modified. And I think when people mention the word live today, they're usually talking about this fourth level of liveness where there's some ongoing computing process. And it's being modified through the edits without ever being stopped unless it's, you know, in general. You might have to stop it for some reason. Okay, so, oh, I missed my little diagrams here. Here's the uh, informative level. And here's something that's executable, a little bit more form. It's probably drawn in the machine so that it, uh, it's syntactically correct as a flowchart and so forth. But it can be executed. And then we've got uh, something where the system uh, responds to uh, human edits, uh, responds instantly. And then there's this uh, version where the process is ongoing. And it's, it's uh, running as it's being edited. So here, uh, here are some of these systems in a bit more detail. Um, Sketchpad is back there in 1963, Pygmalion in 77, um, Chipwitz in 84, and, uh, and various other ones. Um, and let me tell you now about Chipwitz. There's a screenshot of the original 1984 version for the Macintosh. The Macintosh had just come out, and I don't know how these folks had managed to put together this environment so quickly. They must have been working on it for another computer before that. Um, it's been re-implemented, um, and I do have a running version of that on this computer, but I'm afraid it might take too long to try to demonstrate that. But in, in any case, here's the representation of the program as a kind of flowchart in a cellular layout with these various uh, arrows that can lead you from one box to the next. Some of these boxes represent uh, conditional uh, expressions, and some of them represent actions and uh, sensing uh, steps with the conditional things involve sensing. Um, and then there's a robot here. There, there's the robot which can uh, navigate in, in uh, this or many other environments to accomplish missions. Okay. A system that exhibited level four liveness, so Chipwitz was live at level three. Uh, a, one of the first systems to exhibit level four liveness was this system called Conman by Paul Haberly, who implemented this on a silicon graphics machine uh, and was taking advantage of the you know, relatively great power of those machines in their, their day to show how you could configure a visualization using a live program or a live you know, data flow environment uh, interactively. And so this particular example shows this hemispherical display of some geometric model that's being controlled by uh, various widgets and wired up uh, live. You could, you could edit these connections and, the, and you could tweak the parameters using the sliders and so forth and the, uh, the model would be uh, displayed differently um, immediately. This thing would just keep running. Okay. Um, so let me tell you briefly about the data factory which is uh, something that I presented at uh, the VLHCC meeting in Auckland in 2003, um, where what I was trying to achieve is a, uh, a combination of those two kinds of immediacy, uh, both liveness and visual immediacy, to make something that um, students, other novice uh, computing folks, might be able to easily learn how to use and do something with. And, uh, and so the the design principles for it are, are basically these. Every data element is visible by default and has a location on the screen, a place. It has place. Um, these data elements move, uh, uh, so there's data flows that are going on, and they're continuous with some exceptions. So at the processing modules, the cells of the factory, the uh, processing cells, there might be some discontinuities, but everything else is, 
in principle continuous. And then um, the, the environment offers level uh, four liveness. You don't have to have it running all the time, but uh, it's there. So here's a, a little uh, MP4 of uh, a little session with the data factory. It's pretty primitive by modern standards, but I wanted to at least uh, show you something concrete and uh, mention some of the importances of this thing. Um, you won't see any level four liveness until the very end. Um, yesterday, uh, Julian Rohrruber mentioned that uh, there's a sort of uncertainty principle that certainly Heisenberg has promoted in physics that you know, either you know the momentum of something or its position, but you can't know both. And if you have a program representation or a, s a computing representation, it can be a state, right? Did I get this right? It can either be a state or it can be uh, a prescription for a process, but it can't be both. I think, though, that the data factory is one example of, uh, of, of, of a representation where you can have both, because if you capture this representation uh, in a factory file and reload it again, you have both state and process specified there. Um, I don't know if I can do this, but I have another example uh, loaded, an actual an actual running version of the data factory with a with a uh, 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 prime number <coughs> uh, generator using a sieve of uh, Veritasenes. I, I might show that at the end if there's if there's time, but probably won't do that. So what's going on here is that uh, a, a factory is being constructed that takes some random data in, in and uh, clones it, and then compares one copy of the number with uh, two. And if, if two divides it evenly, um, then that operates, that, uh, then a switch will be uh, flipped so that the number will go to the even output uh, conveyor belt, or it will uh, uh, go to the odd conveyor belt output. So there, there are the numbers going along the conveyor belts. Um, and what we're going to do is to make a live intervention here just to show, show that it's possible. Um, any questions on this <laughs> that I could take right now? Okay, so we're going to draw Sorry, what more of the practical applications of this uh, program? Education, I guess, is the word. <laughs> Whenever there's nothing practical. <laughs> Say, oh, it's for, it's for education. It's conceptual, yeah. Um, it was proposed to use this for, for music generation, but we ne I never implemented that. So. <laughs> somebody, else, somebody else should do it. Oh, yeah, yeah there, was, there was the live, the new conveyor belt that was drawn there. We didn't have to stop the program. What happened right. to it's <laughs> Well, it depends. <laughs> it's like real life, right? <laughs> the streets fill up with cars. Things are stuck. Yeah, someone has to come in and sweep. The tow truck has to come in and carry cars away. Okay. Um, I, I want to uh, uh, mention some proposed extensions to the, this uh, four-level liveness hierarchy that uh, were stimulated in part by uh, the, uh, the live programming workshop two years ago that was held in San Francisco, and that's where I met Thor and some, some others of you who were in, involved in uh, live coding. Um, so uh, I think that this, e even if you don't subscribe to the particular levels of liveness I'm proposing, the issue of what liveness is in relation to time, something that Julian alluded to yesterday, and it's worth uh, further reflection. In order to do this, I'd like to use a little visual notation to describe the levels of liveness. And uh, this notation involves essentially two uh, symbols. One is an editing operation uh, represented by a diamond. Uh, the other symbol is this dot, which signifies the beginning, or, or let's say a, uh, 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 a checkpoint in, um, in a computation. And if an arrow comes out of it, that's the beginning of a computation. So that's the execution of the program, and it, it presumably uh, can continue there. So um, with level one liveness, the representation and the editing has nothing to do with any execution. There, uh, there's no, the computer can't do anything 
with the with the documentation alone. Okay. Um, in level two liveness, the user says, "Okay, run it now," and then sometime later. So this is this is a timeline. You know, here's the here's the editing operation, and sometime later, uh, the user says, "Now run," and the computer figures out how to run it, either by compiling it or interpreting it or whatever. In level three liveness, there's a sequence of edits, and each one of those triggers a new execution of the program. Uh, and then in level four liveness, we've got this continuing execution where there are changes that take place in the execution. Presumably, the trajectory, in some sense, of the uh, control flow will change in response to these editing events. But you see it's one continuous uh, uh, stream of execution there. So with the, the, new, the proposed new levels of liveness, the question is, well, uh, what's, what's the trend here? The trend is that uh, the latency between edit and operation is shrinking. So uh, here it's infinite because we never execute the, the representation. Here there, here's the, some finite thing. Here it's shrinking to almost nothing. The system is responding as quickly as it can. And here, in some sense, there is no uh, latency. Um, at least the, s the system doesn't stop. It keeps running. Um, and so where can we go when, when the latency is zero? We have to go to negative latency, which is what this is about. So here is our uh, level five liveness where we have sort of a tactical prediction going on. Here is the stream of edits and the computation uh, up to here. And then th what the computer is doing is, is trying to anticipate the next edit of the user and propose alternative branches uh, for the computation. And uh, here, sometime after these have been proposed, the user selects one of them. And that one continues where the others stop. Okay. And uh, just, just to suggest that that can be uh, continued to one more level, um, it's the same sort of thing, except now, from a semantic point of view, we're taking a huge leap by trying to actually complete the program that the, that the user was presumably writing. Okay. And um, you might say that this is all pie in the sky in science fiction, but there are uh, a number of examples where, where these things have been sort of tried out to some, some degree. So here's the uh, extended liveness hierarchy with tactically predictive liveness at level four, strategically predictive liveness at level six. And let me just comment a little bit on these. Uh, already we have tools in software development environments that uh, that do things like try to predict what you're about to type. Command completion is just a, a simple example of level five liveness of a type. It's not really semantic uh, execution there, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going in that direction. Um, and uh, here's a, a demonstration that uh, Luke Church did some years. Luke, are you here this morning? Uh, <laughs> if there are any questions about this, you'll have to answer them. <laughs> but um, uh, Luke demonstrated that uh, one could compose a program through a, a series of selections uh, based on uh, uh, you know, predictions that the system is making about what, what's likely to be wanted next. In this case, it's at a character level. Um, uh, and so this continuous gesture of selecting these characters would result in a program. But that's an example of, of level five liveness. Okay. Um, cl clearly, uh, the knowledge in order to make predictions has to come from somewhere. And uh, nowadays, uh, most programmers are wired into, or not wired, they're wirelessly connected to the internet. <laughs> and, uh, and it's certainly possible to collect large amounts of, of data about what programmers are doing through tools like Eclipse and so forth. And so the kind of data that can be used to make these predictions is available. Data mining can probably you know, make this work uh, reasonably well. Um, what you do with the information is going to depend clearly on things like uh, uh, programmer preferences, uh, computational resources available, as well as whatever knowledge is available about what's, what's likely to be wanted next. And at the strategic level, we, we certainly have lots of people doing lots of coding. The more people we have doing lots of coding, the more likely it is that a lot of the things that people are trying to create have been created before. 
And that really makes it even easier to perhaps do this kind of strategically predictive live. Oh, you're creating a you know, communication client for such and such protocol. Here, this is probably what you want. <laughs> and the system might you know, partially infer that, synthesize it you know, based on actions that have been created, uh, taken so far. So um, I'm going to get ready to close here. I want to talk a little bit about liveness in software engineering and uh, maybe live coding, depending on uh, questions. Um, but uh, the live programming workshop took place in the context of the International Conference on Software Engineering in San Francisco. And then we had an interesting event uh, a little bit later that year where uh, at VLHCC 2013 we had a, a duet. We had a, a couple of sessions on live programming and we featured a duet between uh, Andrew Sorensen and Ben Swift um, between Dagstuhl and San Jose, California. And, um, and some of these issues came up at that time. So um, uh, one of the goals of live programming for software is to just keep programmers in the flow so that they can be as creative as possible, get their work done. We want to shorten the feedback loop between coding or debugging and the perceived execution behavior. Um, Brian Berg um, just finished his PhD at the University of Washington, had a very uh, interesting approach to supporting this goal, which was to capture an execution of an interactive program, like someone playing a game, capture it in great detail, and record it. It's just like you might go to a, a, you know, a, con a live concert, record it, and then s present your recording as recorded live at Carnegie Hall. Is, is it live? Well, it was recorded live at Carnegie Hall, which means there's a, there was some sort of liveness there. So Brian's recordings would be uh, typically someone playing a game, uh, and because of the way he set up the software uh, with, with uh, shims and JavaScript and so forth, he captured all of the events that happened. He could play back that, that gameplay in great and total detail. And then uh, his tools would, would allow uh, a programmer to, to basically replay in great detail that computation. So you could get a very accurate uh, inspection of, and figure out you know, exactly uh, what might be causing a particular bug and so forth. Um, another issue is that uh, lots of programmers nowadays multitask. And when you multitask, you get interrupted and you lose flow. You lose the sense of liveness because of the multitasking. So uh, another recent PhD, uh, Chris Parnin from Georgia Tech, uh, as part of his work, uh, explored ways to help programmers re-engage with, uh, with a problem they were working on before they were interrupted. Um, here's a particular problem for, for liveness in software. I don't think it, I, maybe, the, maybe it's a problem in live coding too, but I don't think so. Uh, liveness is useless if the program that's running doesn't execute the code that you just edited. Okay. Now, in live coding, typically you have a loop, and and most of the changes you're making are in this loop, and this loop is being executed. And so, in the very next iteration, the new code will be will be executed. But what if you're working on a larger project and you're editing some code that uh, that isn't going to get executed because the conditional over here doesn't go the right way or the subroutine isn't being called or something like that. What can be done about that? Um, we want the benefits of liveness to, to, uh, to help programmers debug their code. And so uh, here are some possible solutions to this problem. Um, so uh, already IDE affordances give, e even if we've got, we've got a running program over here, we're getting syntactic checks and other things that are almost like, uh, like live feedback. Uh, uh, in the parts of the program that aren't executing. Another idea is to have a secondary execution. Maybe in live coding, you're not sure if what you're about to edit is, is going to sound good to the audience. So you w actually want to have phones on and listen to it before you, <laughs> before you make it live for everybody else. Um, there's this notion of secondary execution where you're going to test something out in a sandbox before you make it part of the main computation. So this is something that might be a solution to this problem for software engineering as well. Um, but how do these secondary executions actually run? You don't want them to start 
all over and have to redo everything that the main branch did. So maybe you fork the main branch. Maybe you have to make some assumptions about what the starting state is for the secondary execution that's not quite true for the main execution, but is going to allow you to, to get the benefits of liveness and debug the new component uh, before you switch it live into the main, the main execution. Um, so there might be checkpoints that have been pre-computed. There might be artificially generated checkpoints that are used for this purpose. Um, and then we might actually have multiple levels of execution, a main execution, various sandbox executions, and ways of testing in the sandbox executions before they all, uh, uh, before you actually go to the main execution. And finally, uh, maybe there's some benefit to having what we might call uh, level 3.5 liveness, where you have, uh, you have certain kinds of program changes that can be swapped live into the main execution. Um, uh, but, uh, but if they're not going to be executed, uh, then you need to do something different. You need to stop the main execution and do, do one of these tricks that I mentioned before. And it might be an intelligent system that makes the, the choice of whether to interrupt the computation so that the new stuff can be executed or to let it keep going and to do something uh, secondary or whatever. So these are some of the issues that uh, c come into play when you try to make programming environments as responsive as musical instruments to, uh, to human events. And so uh, if anyone's interested in more details, I'll be happy to uh, provide some kind of references such as this one here. Um, th so thank you. I'd like to thank Alan Blackwell, who was part of a group that hosted me in Cambridge last year. And I don't think I would be here today if you hadn't uh, kindly accepted my request to come visit. So thank you, and I want to thank the organizers for, for organizing this and inviting me to speak to you today. And thank you all for uh, coming this morning and uh, letting me talk to you. <laughs> Is there time for a question or two? I think so, yes. OK. I agree with you. I agree with you. Actually, I have another talk this, this afternoon about problem solving. And the idea is to say that, you know, I, I guess the biggest difference between uh, software engineering and live coding is that, you know, software engineering, is pur its purpose is to create a final product that's mm -hmm. this piece of code, this software, whereas live coding is performance, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and problem solving usually is thought of the same way. As the, the goal is usually to get the solution. But, but another way of thinking about it is, is that it's a process and it's a performance art as well. And, and I think errors are very much a part of, of the performance. Uh, I mean, in jazz, when I make a mistake, like I did, <laughs> uh, it's an opportunity to try to, to, make, to make it part of a story. You make, you, when, when I slip on a note here, then I'll do it again because they, if you do it multiple times, it becomes, it becomes <laughs> part of the structure. Yeah. Um, and, and errors in programming haven't been thought of that way, but there may be some way to, to make them more significant in terms of the it's performance. It's taking a part on the, on the code itself, like on the, on the, on the bigger program itself. I, mean, I, I, I struggle a lot to, to make errors to be part of my 
pose without breaking the code and, and taking me out of the code. And I always miss this this kind of things. I mean, I, I know a couple of tricks to make like tries and catches and mm -hmm. to integrate errors on the, mm -hmm. on, the on the program. But right. like uh, programming software is unlikely done to integrate this kind of things into your process right. of coding, which has yeah. been, might be something that, that we are kind of uh, not taking into account so much as, as maybe we should. And I, 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 I agree, I agree. <laughs> yeah, other questions? Uh, so, so, seems, well, the idea came to mind as a slight extension of a combination of some of the things you were saying, which was, you were talking about how you, if a bit of a program isn't going to get run, how do you figure out whether it's right or not? And also the idea of um, predicting what they're trying to write. You kind of combine those two with the idea of unit testing. So the idea that it predicts, it figures out what you're trying to write, and then instead of writing it for you, it lets you write it, but it, instead it generates a unit test, which then tests whether what you've done operates correctly, and that, that kind of applies also to the bits, the, the bits of the program that aren't going to get run, mm -hmm. so you just unit test them. Sounds like a great PhD thesis for somebody. <laughs> great. That's a great idea. exactly how to kind of put this into a question, but I'm looking at a lot of what you're doing, um, and partly what, what Julian was saying yesterday too, this, uh, it maybe relates to this thing like what you were saying about problem solving. You know, there's this kind of sense that like when you're programming to produce a software product, you're, you're working towards getting the same solution. Uh, and in a sense, the difference between that and performance perhaps is that a performance is, is you know, very consciously, um, Art that's happening in time, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas the performance, the, the, the software thing, in a way, like I mean, it matters for practical reasons how long it takes you to do it, but it doesn't. But what, what matters, you know? But nobody cares about that in a sense afterwards. But you care about it whether the product works. Um, and I think you know, also like looking at a lot of the data flow things, you, you know, they, they they sort of suggest you know functional programming or something that's kind of stateless or something. Um, but thinking a little bit back to what Julian was saying, um, you know, one of the things. I guess what I want to say, like the problem, the problem with music is, I think that music is stable. What what happened before matters, um, and so I'm just wondering if you if you have any thoughts, maybe about how uh, for something like when you're doing like a time-based art form, as opposed to using that argument, does this work differently in any way? Are there extra considerations that you need to make in terms of how you're branching or how or or, or how do we deal with that? Is that? I'm not sure if that's a question at the end. But <laughs> it's a good. It's a good observation. I, I don't have a really good answer, except that I think that uh, most computer programmers just don't think that way. They don't think of their, their programming activity as any kind of performance, with a few exceptions. And, and of course, the life coding community is the growing exception. Um, but there's so many aspects of state in, in, in when you're programming. Uh, what you did before, I mean, my biggest challenge in programming is kind of remembering what I was trying to do uh, a few moments ago because those errors that come up are very disruptive. As soon as you try to deal with this error, you forget everything else you were trying to do. And, um, and, and so it's very important to kind of keep, keep uh, records of mental state, cognitive state. And, and as I get older, I find it harder and harder to do that uh, without, <coughs> without taking notes. Yeah. I think pair programming is a pretty common thing now, which is a good entry point into performance culture. Uh huh. Yeah, the collaborative aspect, I think, uh, can overcome a lot of these problems. You're at least performing for one other person. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. 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 Um, uh, just about the terminology of liveness, I think in live coding, we talk about liveness in terms of immediacy, um, I think, based on your work, largely. Um, but when I talk to people from outside the field, I think I have a different idea. Um, particularly due to Auslander, I think, and his ideas about mediatization. I think it's, a, a, as far as I can tell, more about the distance between you and the end result. Um, and from that definition, live coding is not very live, because you have this media in between being the programming language. Uh -huh. um, so, I'm, I mean, it's just a problem, really, I'm raising. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a, a, an interdisciplinary problem. Um, I'm wondering if this is something that you've thought about in... Not very much, but I think, you know, there are ways to lower that distance further. I mean, uh, someone who's maybe 
we saw examples, of all kinds of examples of conventional instruments yesterday with live coding. Mm -hmm. And if you're singing and live coding at the same time, I think you're really reducing that distance quite a bit because the vocal part of it is, is, is immediate. It's, I don't think anyone would argue that when you're singing there's any distance between your, your thinking and your expression. Yeah, but I suppose the distance here is that there's this thing in between which shapes what you're doing. So um, a programming language um, is a media between you and the end result. Mm -hmm. So it has certain affordances right. that shape what you do. Right. Um, and from Auslander's perspective, I think that would be um, less live than something that you just press something on the piano and it makes the sound. Uh, so it's not about yeah. the time, R but right. about the kind of... The yeah, the kind of representation that yeah, we use. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with that. I mean, uh, mm. I, I think it's nice when we have these systems. Um, who was the artist who was doing the ICSI live uh, performance last night with that interesting board? And I mean, that seemed, yeah. you know, it, it seemed very immediate what she was doing with the board, and I could hear the effects. Um, so, so when you combine these special, special interactive devices, special keyboards, and the live coding, I think we're overcoming some of that. I'm a little worried that we're okay. running out of time, yeah. so if we, we can take further questions, but maybe Alan, if you come up, and um, the next presenter, maybe, and presenter, <laughs> and then we continue. So, uh, Anna, how's that? I suppose if I, uh, maybe I'll ask a dumb question from outside of the live coding community, in the sense of, um, I wonder what's lost by shortening the feedback loop. Um, because oh. actually, as an observer, it seems as if the, the, the distance from the feedback loop is one of the critical spaces of inline coding, in the sense that it opens up a really peculiar kind of temporal indeterminacy. Um, and I think there's something about the quality of split attention that seems to be active in live coding, that for me makes it a really critical practice, um, and different to other kinds of instrumentation. So I'm just curious. I'm not a live coder. Yeah, so I, I think there is something lost, which is that opportunity to reflect. Mm -hmm. Uh, often, sometimes, you have to think for a few moments to figure out the solution to some little problem in an environment where you're not automatically short of that time, those things may suffer. Uh, Trade-offs, clearly. Yeah. But that's, that's an interesting point. Others may have better answers than I Yes, along the same line of thought,